Any explanation of the automotive sales industry in the U.S. is best served by acknowledging the inception of the automobile itself. But this is no easy task. There's no one definitive moment in history where a single brilliant inventor walked into a proverbial garage with tools, metal, and gasoline, and emerged with grease all over his face wearing coveralls proclaiming, I have something the world has never seen. While many credit Carl Benz, or even Gottlieb Wilhelm Daimler as the pioneers of the first automobile at the end of the 19th century, credit should also be given to Frenchman Nicolas Joseph Cugnot, whose steam-powered road vehicle was the first of its kind in 1769, or Nicolas Otto for inventing the first effective gas motor engine in 1861. Though the popular credit given to Carl Benz is not misplaced, as he earned the first patent for the automobile in Germany in 1886, in the same year, fellow German Gottlieb Wilhelm Daimler, with the help of Wilhelm Maybach, built his own version of the automobile. Had they tried to race each other, the winner would have scorched the loser at a fireball speed of approximately 8 miles per hour. Soon after the first automobiles were doing donuts in Germany, the U.S. experienced its own inception of the automobile. As was the case in Europe, the beginning of the car industry in the U.S. cannot be credited to one individual either. Before Henry Ford built his first automobile in 1896, bicycle makers Charles and Frank Durier tested a gas-powered car in 1893. They went on to set up what is widely considered the first business aimed at commercially selling automobiles. Of course, Ransom E. Olds, Elwood Haynes, Hiram Percy Maxim, and Charles Brady King should not be neglected either. Elwood Haynes road tested a car in Indiana in 1894, but no more than a couple of miles into his maiden voyage, a policeman, on a bike, pulled him over. Elwood proceeded to receive what many historians jokingly consider the first speeding ticket, which was undoubtedly followed up with the first line of excuses given to a cop through a driver's side window. And though Hiram Percy Maxim's gas-powered car built in 1895 was just as impressive as Haynes and his historical joyride, the stroke of genius that followed for Hiram was even more impressive, though possibly only in hindsight. You see, Hiram designed an electronic automobile, and Ransom E. Olds built a steam-powered car in 1887, almost a decade before his gasoline-powered car launched his career. Little did they know, they were ahead of the green movement by more than a century. They might even be the first hipsters. Who knows? Olds would certainly make a name for himself as a manufacturer. But what kept men like the Durier brothers from reaching the historical fame earned by guys like Henry Ford? Well, for starters, Ford built and sold several early models of his car to finance his attempts to improve what he'd already built. This pursuit of perfection, along with his interest in race testing his cars, ruined some early business partners. As a result, the Henry Ford Company split ways with the man that gave them their name and formed the Cadillac Motor Company. Henry regrouped and formed the Ford Motor Company. But Ford would need more than a great car to make his new company exponentially profitable. After all, the first Model T's took approximately 728 minutes to make. This drove up the cost of production, making the car less affordable. The price point was a hard pill to swallow for a man determined to bring the automobile to the masses. Ford's victory in court against George Selden's automobile patent eliminated royalty costs for early manufacturers, but he'd still need to lower his prices, and to do that, he'd need to make more cars in less time. Out of this necessity, the assembly line was born. Ford cut his production time from a single Model T from 728 minutes to just over 93 minutes. As a result, Ford Motor Company flourished, more cars were made, prices were lowered, and more cars were sold. Of course, as is the way of capitalism, his colossal rise was met with inevitable competition. In 1908, William Durant spent a whopping $2,000 to incorporate General Motors in New Jersey. By 1915, his Buick was the strongest car in his line. Much of Buick's success can be attributed to a man named Walter P. Chrysler, who brought the same assembly line approach to manufacturing Buicks. Durant would eventually appoint Chrysler as the president of Buick after his leadership tripled Buick production and created one of the strongest car names in the market. Around the same time, Ranson Eli Olds was enjoying his own level of success as vice president of Olds Motor Works. Although Olds is a major name in the establishment of the U.S. car industry, it was a pair of mechanics, brothers, that ran Olds Machine Shop for several years who made equally significant contributions to the brand's success. As a result, when a 10% stake in Henry Ford's up-and-coming Ford Motor Company was offered to these men, they took the risk, and it paid off in millions of dollars in profit. 
With this newfound wealth, the Dodge brothers eventually branched off and started their own company, building and selling their Dodge automobiles. Eventually, they sold their company to Chrysler, who by this time had split with Durant and Buick. All of these three developments culminated in forming what we now know as the Big Three. Ford, GM, and Chrysler became the three pillars of the American automotive industry and remain the three largest domestic manufacturers to this day. One of the first major challenges for the Big Three came with the onset of World War II. From 1943 to 1945, commercial manufacturing turned to war production and no doubt helped fuel a victory for America. Post-World War II, the U.S. enjoyed an economic boom. Soldiers returning with their hard-earned military wages helped fuel consumer demands for cars, and after a three-year hiatus, commercial manufacturing resumed. Demand outweighed supply and the car industry was back on track. There's an old saying, bad habits are created during good times, and good habits are created during bad times. This was certainly true during the car boom that followed the end of the war. For the car industry, bad pricing habits developed very quickly. Dealers were free to price gouge their way into recouping any losses sustained during their break in production. Consumers suffered the most, with some dealerships selling cars to the highest bidder. No doubt these business practices influenced poor industry stereotypes until 1958, when Senator Almer Stilwell Monroney introduced a bill to the Senate that required dealerships to place a sticker on their cars that clearly communicated the manufacturer's suggested retail price and include a list of specifications for every vehicle. And thus, the Monroney sticker was born. This marked arguably the most significant development in how cars are sold all over the world and is one of the first regulations geared towards consumer protection in the auto industry.